Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the uh, MMA card for tomorrow, November 6th, uh, returning to Madison Square Garden. A uh, really exciting uh, times for MMA and for New York City and for Madison Square Garden and also for Sheets. Uh, I'm actually going. I'm going to be attending my very first uh, MMA event. I'm going to shout out to Chris Diaspara from Crown uh, Basketball, who uh, helped me uh, train my, uh, my teens. I did AAU. He's really into MMA and he was able to score some tickets for this. Uh, he's a really, really good dude. And, um, we're going to be heading out there tomorrow. Um, we're really looking forward to it. And it's a real, it's a tremendous card, both from the fan perspective. And I think it's a really, really very gettable card from a, um, from a DFS perspective as well. So I want to, I want to, I do want to talk about um, the overall view of the slate. And I want to try to get to most of the fights. Um, the, the thing is, is that I already know where I'm going to be keying these fights, um, which fights I'm going to be keying in DFS. And we have to start with the two five round fights. You know, you have Usman Covington, which is five round fights, both very, very talented. You're going to have a lot of volume and you, you're probably going to have to get some of this fight, um, if not all of it. So uh, I am not going to, you know, try to predict who is going to win. Um, you know, I will say that Usman rates to be about a two and a half to one favorite. So he's probably going to win about two and a half, you know, more times than Covington. And he's being priced accordingly. So I, I, there's no real big stylistic, you know, advantage one way or the other. They're both kind of strikers. Um, Covington does put out a lot of volume. So he does have that possibility of actually getting there in a loss, which makes it a little different. And um, you certainly make a case for him. So I would definitely make sure to get one of these two in most every lineup. And again, I don't really have much of an opinion on the fight, except to say that Covington, I, I do think is live at two and a half to one, if that means anything. Um, and Usman is probably going to win about two and a half times more often than Covington. It's the best way I can describe it. Um, the other one that you probably have to get the uh, you know get exposure to is uh, Nama Yunus versus uh, Zhang Wei uh, Zhang Wei Li. Uh, this is a rematch from um, when they fought a couple of months ago. And all I will say is this: when they fought a couple of months ago, uh, Zhang Wei Li was about a two to one favorite. She was eighty nine hundred compared to Rose's seventy three hundred, and Rose knocked her out in the first round. And just all of a sudden, they're now pick them. Uh, so something is wrong. Right. Um, either they shouldn't have been two to one versus two to one last time, or they shouldn't be pick on this time, I think. Um, so I think a lot of the sharp money is coming in on Zhang Wei Li for that reason. But nonetheless, it is a pick and fight um, and it's being priced accordingly. You're getting five rounds. You know, there's no big stylistic edge as far as DraftKings scoring one way or the other. So I think that you want to have, you know, somebody from that fight, too. So when you're building your lineups, I would take one of the Kuzman Covington, Usman Covington, one of the Rose Wade Lee fight. The other fight, which I feel as though, again, you just have to have is, is even though it's not the you know next, not the main event, or it's not even five rounds, or it's not even, I think, the third fight to last, is this Gaethje Chandler fight. Um, if you look at the at the inside the distance props and and when these rate when this rates to finish, you'll see. That's basically pick them to finish, you know, inside of one and a half rounds. Both these guys are just going to just just try to tear each other apart, and and this is this is a, is a very very good chance that it finishes. And if it finishes, you know, you're going to want the winner. That's just the way it is. Both are going to be putting out a lot of volume. And as far as who's going to win, I don't know. Uh, Gaethje, you know, is about a two to one favorite. I think that's fair. Uh, I'm not one to be able to assess that that's kind of off in any way. I don't have any particular lean uh, every once in a while. I will, but not in this particular spot. So uh, I would make sure to get some of that fight. So as far as DraftKings goes, you really want to, you know, your, 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 your builds are pretty straightforward in, in a way. I mean, you want to get those three fights in, but that's not the end of the story because you do have to fill out all your lineups and it's not exactly easy to do that. Um, you are going to have to probably, you know, pick some underdogs uh, throughout the throughout the course of the fight, uh, throughout the course of the card, and prioritize the the favorites that you like. So I want to go over. I do want to go fight by fight, and then I, well, I'll highlight who 
you know, who I'm playing. So I, I, I get to have the order wrong. I don't know. But actually, the first fight of the night, Vergara, Osborne, I think that's that's not bad. I mean, that inside the distance prop is OK. And uh, I wouldn't go 100 percent this fight, but I definitely think that it's a fight that's within your your pool. Right. So if you can build lineups with Osborne and or Vergara, I think they both make sense. Let's just double check it. The inside the distance prop is it's one of the better ones of ones that you don't have to play, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah, so it's fight doesn't go to a decision, minus 175. Um, it's about pick them to get through the second round. Makes sense. So I would take a shot at either of these two guys. I mean, I think that makes makes some sense. Uh, Souza against Bandajarian. I don't like Souza at all as an underdog. Uh, I do like uh, Bandajarian as a decent favorite. He doesn't really have that grappling and wrestling that makes him a smash play like some of the ones we've gotten used to. So it's not as if he's a lock or anything like that. But I do think that for lack of, you know, that many options outside of those three main fights, I do think that he's definitely live. I mean, he's a really, really good kickboxer. I think he could get a, a, uh, a KO and he gets it in the, the first round. I mean, that, that's certainly going to get there. And if he gets there in the second round, that might get there too. So I do like Bagdazarian here. Uh, he's going to be in my, you know, my pool of shuffling these $9,200 guys. Um, the Jacoby Allen fight, this is what I'm probably fading. They brought Jacoby here on short notice and they priced him like he was just going to knock him out in the first round. He's, he's 9,600. And if you look at the inside the distance prop, it's really not that, that promising. Um, let me just see if I could find it here. I just, I expanded all of these. So it's kind of difficult. Um, Justin Jacoby is four to one favorite, but his inside the distance prop is not that great. I mean, it's, it's a pick him here to go under two and a half rounds at 3.9 to one. That's, that's not going to be good enough for me. So I'm, he's going to be one that I fade. I mean, he's probably going to win, but as far as DFS goes, uh, I'm probably not going to be playing him. Volante Barnett, uh, this is definitely the lowest level uh, bout on the card. You see Barnett, he's just the, this big, enormous dude. I mean, short and heavy. And Volante is, you know, very, very low level. But, you know, a lot can happen in low level heavyweight fights. And these guys are priced right. You know, uh, if any of the, either of these guys gets a KO, you're going to want them in your lineup. So I consider this fight kind of a fringe fight. Like, I, I wouldn't play Volante but I'm probably going to get a, get a couple of lineups, a um, uh, couple of lineups in here. Um, just one second. Um, so I'll get a couple of lines with Barnett, but really nothing with Volante. So Gary against Williams, uh, Gary, very, very strong favorite here. I mean, I like him much more than, um, than Jacoby. Uh, he can do it a lot of different ways. They're putting him on, on a kind of a showcase here. Uh, it's, it's a pick him to go under, you know, one and a half rounds. Um, I think this is a very, very strong favorite. I'm certainly going to include him in his my lineups. Uh, I don't like anything on the other side. I'm not going to take any punts with um, with uh, Jordan Williams. Shabazian Imovov. Um, Shabazian is somewhat of a live underdog, except for the fact that his win condition is not that great. Um, he, When I say that, he doesn't really rate to get an early KO, and he also doesn't really rate to put on a lot, a lot of grappling. So if he wins, his score is not going to be that terrific. Now, at 7,700, maybe you don't, you won't need his score to be great, but usually at that price, you're going to need to do a little better than just get the win. So I consider him uh, a kind of a fringe play. Um, I'll include him in my pool. I'll probably get to some of him, but he's not going to be prioritized. And Imovov at 8,500 is to me exactly the kind of guy I don't want to play. I mean, he's, you know, he's a striker. He's really not going to, doesn't rate to get a finish here. And he doesn't, you know, he doesn't, like I said, have that grappling upside. So I don't really like Imavov here as a favorite uh, in DFS at all. So pause against Curtis. Uh, I want to, you know, tout another um, another podcast out there. If you want to, if you want to, if you want to be talked into playing Chad Curtis, um, is it Chad or Charles Curtis, Curtis, the Dogger Pass podcast, which I listen to. I mean, they go on for 15 minutes about this guy, and 
you're, you're going to be convinced to play him <laughs> after you listen to it. That's the best I can describe it. So I'm not going to get in all of it, but I'm kind of sold. Uh, I'm kind of into it. And so I'm definitely going to play some of him as an underdog. Um, I, I just can't really get into all of it, but, but it certainly just made a lot of sense to me. And yet on the other side, you have Hawes, who does his win condition is very conducive to, to his price tag. In other words, he might not win, but if he does, it's probably going to either be kind of a first round, you know, KO, or he could actually put some wrestling on, on Curtis over the course of three rounds. So I do think that if he does win, I think he's going to score well. Um, but I don't necessarily think he's going to win. So I do think that this fight is really close to a fight that you want to, you want to play. Um, Bobby Green, Iakinta, perfect fight to, to pass on. Uh, I don't really like the underdog. And the, the, the favorite is a pure striker, no grappling upside, very little KO, KO upside. So it's going to be a pass. And there are two fights left, actually three fights left. We're going to get to the, get to the couple of them in a second, but let's dispatch of the Vera uh, Edgar fight first. Edgar, from what I've heard, he's kind of a legend in MMA and, you know, he's very, he's older and he's tough. And, you know, the, these types of fights for me are usually fights to pass on. I don't know what it is, but whenever you have these like younger guys that fight these like older legends, I almost feel like they let up on him sometimes. So Vera and Vera is kind of known for being kind of a low volume guy, not really a finisher. So I don't really like the Vera side. I did like him earlier in the week, but I kind of got off him. And I think Edgar is going to be kind of the sentimental play. People are going to want to play him. And yeah, I mean, if he just comes up with some, you know, 42 year old stuff, you know, maybe gets takedowns and 7,400, maybe he's live a little bit. I currently don't have him. He's going to be the last guy I might consider just kind of throwing in. Um, just because I think his win condition is very, is very conducive to a good score. You know, I do think that he's going to have to probably get some takedowns to, to, to get a W here. Um, so I, I, I'm going to consider that. So right now I don't have him, but I, he's going to be the last guy I probably put in. Next two fights, uh, Burgos Quarantillo. This, this is going to be a tremendous fight. Uh, this, both guys bring just a S ton of, of volume and pace I mean, it's going to be a war. I mean, Billy Quarantino is known for just having unlimited cardio and Burgos is just known for just never stopping with his boxing. So um, this fight is going to be awesome. Um, now, with respect to DFS, you know, you can look at it one of two ways. Number one, Quarantino did have some takedowns in his last fight. He's not a great, great wrestler, um, but I do think that that's going to be his path. So I think if he's smart, that's what he's going to end up trying to do. And if you have a guy that has unlimited cardio, is going to continue to go for takedowns at 7,200. I think that's somebody that you want. Um, his win condition is very, very conducive to good drafting scoring. And so this is a very, very live underdog. Is he going to win? Uh, probably not. He's a two to one underdog. And on the other side, you have Burgos who, who, he doesn't really have those takedowns, but he's got so much volume and he has hit so hard. And, and Quarantino is not the greatest striker in the world. We, we saw him get kind of pieced up by, um, boy, oh boy, I forget who it was, two fights ago, oh, just, uh, Tucker. And Burgos is certainly a better striker than Tucker. And Burgos can really shred this guy. So if Burgos does not get taken down, Burgos could KO him. And, and he could, even in a third round KO, get there because of all the other significant strikes he can pile on. So that combined with the fact that, that Quarantino might end up being somewhat popular, you all, you might get some good leverage by playing Burgos against him. So I do like both sides of this fight. Um, I like it a lot. Um, and then the last one is I, I, I'm just not going to get talked off of this tape. I, you know, people have been telling me I'm nuts, but so I think that Pereira Michelitas is is as close to a fight that you have to have as I'm going to come up with outside of the three uh, uh, main ones. And the reason I bring it up is this, you have a complete style clash, which are both completely win condition based. In other words, you have Pereira, who is just a stone kickboxer. Uh, he is awesome striker. He knocked out Israel Asanya. He beat him twice. I think um, he is just awesome at that. But he's a kickboxer. He's not really an MMA guy. 
And you have Mitchell Edis, who's not a really great striker, but he does have some takedowns and wrestling in his, in, his, in his back pocket. So, you know, I've heard that that they're, they're throwing Mitchell Edis in just to basically get his ass kicked by, by Pereira so that they could, you know, give Pereira a showcase. But I don't know, man. I, I just feel as though that, you know, even though he's a two and a half, three to one favorite, the win condition is just so like 100% correlated to good scoring that, that I think that Mitchell Edis is kind of a must play. Um, if you're not going to play Pereira, I think if Pereira wins, he KOs, he KOs him. Mitchell Edis tries to take him down. No such luck. And he just gets flat. Okay. And if that's the case, Pereira is great price at 8,900. But if Pereira does get taken down, then Mitchell Edis is a smash play at 7,100. So for me, this is as close as I'm going to get to that fourth fight that you want to kind of lock in. All right. Now, again, 80% of the time, you know, the Mitchell Edis side is going to lose. I'm telling you. But I do think that that, that a percent of the time, you know, you're going to get a good score out of Pereira. And then, then if that's the case, then you're going to need to have some of your other underdogs come in, but that's fine. Um, so that's where I'm at on this card. I think it's a very, very instructive card from DFS, uh, from a DFS perspective. It's going to be a fantastic card from a uh, fan perspective. I hope I did a decent enough job, job breaking it down. Uh, I'm going to enjoy watching it. Hope you guys can catch it. And uh, good luck, everybody.